أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our previous sessions we spoke about the spiritual development of the Prophet and by spiritual development we mean how the way in which the Prophet is gradually introduced to the angelic world we know that from the time that he was weaned according to statements by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and other reports from the time that he was weaned God made his greatest angel accompany him and he would hear angelic voices even as a young boy guiding him towards the most virtuous way of life and this continued the, the Prophet continued to hear angels throughout his life at the age of 37 from the age of 37 to 40 we see that something changes for the Prophet according to numerous narrations in Sunni and Shi'i hadith literature we see that the Prophet begins receiving guidance through dreams you know this is where the Prophet finally sees Jibra'il in his dreams and he's given certain instructions related to prayer and ablution from the age of 40 to 43 the Prophet become the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, he becomes mab'uth nubuwa is established in him so as we mentioned in our previous sessions the 27th of Rajab when the Prophet reaches the age of 40 that marks the beginning of his nubuwa it does not mark the beginning of Quranic revelation and this is a very common misconception so the Prophet is a, he's a, he's a Nabi. His Risala begins, he becomes Rasul at the age of 43 when the Quran actually begins uh, revelation. Now from the age of 40 to 43, the Prophet again, he's praying. And this, this in and of itself is revolutionary because he's playing, he's praying in public spaces to the one true God and this in and of itself is uh, is an act of defiance from the age of 40 to 43 during this three-year period the Prophet only preaches to close family members the operative word being close meaning that at this point even his extended relatives are really not aware of this message so from the age of 40 to 43 the Prophet he becomes a prophet he prays and the Salah that he performs is is very primitive meaning that it's not the elaborate legal prayer that's introduced to Rasulullah uh, on the night of Mi'raj it's a very simple uh, act of devotion comprised probably of of sujood and ruku' maybe but there's no uh, Quranic recitation that's associated with the prayer because the Quran has yet to be revealed. So from the age of 40 to 43, the Prophet only, he preaches only underground. It's an underground movement. He preaches this message of monotheism, of social justice, to close family and friends who he is sure will convert. You know, he shares the message with the likes of you know, Zayd ibn Haritha, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. We mentioned in our previous sessions that when Abu Talib saw Khadija, saw the Prophet Khadija and Ali praying, it was during this three year period. And this is where he says to his son Ja'far, you know, join your, uh, your cousin in, uh, in congregational prayer. At the age of 43, Quranic revelation begins. 
And now the Prophet begins preaching publicly. So prior to the age of 43, and, and when we say that the Prophet begins preaching publicly, it includes his extended family. So the public, the public mission of the Prophet is really two-pronged. The first part of the public uh, mission is to extend an invitation to his extended family as we'll discuss shortly and of course the wider society one of the most interesting things about the beginning of the Quranic revelation is that what's remarkable is how much of the Quran is revealed in such a short period of time so the Quranic revelation, Wahi descends to the Prophet in the form of Quran when he's 43. Within the first five months, so Rasulullah 43, within five months of the first surah, 46 surahs are revealed in the first five months of revelation. I mean, that's a staggering figure. So you see that the majority of the Qur'an is actually reveal, revealed uh, during uh, that early period. Now, now during this period, during this five-month period where surahs of the Qur'an are being revealed in rapid succession, the Prophet is presumably preaching in a semi-private way. Because again, he has yet to receive the divine command to publicize the message. So at the age of 43, Quran is being revealed. He starts to challenge some of the false beliefs of the idol worshippers. He addresses the immoral practices of society. He speaks about the, the economic disparity, the, uh, the financial corruption, the moral corruption and so on and so forth. But he does this in private gatherings. So you see that the Prophet has a strategic, a strategic plan. He doesn't begin this, this mission all guns a-blazing and, and shouting uh, you know, on top of the Kaaba. The Prophet is very uh, methodical. He's very, uh, he's very strategic. He's very wise in the way that he tries to tackle these problems because the Prophet is addressing systemic problems in his community. So it calls for patience, it calls for wisdom. It needs to be done in a very measured way. Now, in terms of the order of revelation, uh, this is a question that many people ask. You know, so the Quran as we have it today in the Mus'haf is not placed in chronological order, meaning that the arrangement, uh, and this is you know, a debate in and of itself about you know, who arranged the Qur'an in the way that it is currently arranged. Now when it comes to the, the chronological order of Qur'anic revelation, there is a general consensus that Surah Al-Alaq is the first Surah to be revealed to the Prophet. Now again, Surah Al-Alaq was not revealed to the Prophet on the 27th of Rajab when he was 40. It happened at the age of 43. Uh, at the uh, in the cave of Hira, so again, the Prophet continues to go and meditate and worship in the cave of Hira even after the age of forty. So at the age of forty-three is when uh, revelation descends upon him. But what I want to draw your attention to uh, about Surah Al-Alaq specifically is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If you, especially if you look at verses nine to nineteen. Allah says, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَا عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى Have you seen the one who forbids a servant when he prays? So there are two things that we notice from Surah Al-Alaq. And Surah Al-Alaq, according to the majority opinion, is the first surah that is revealed to the Prophet. Number one is that there is prayer. So even though we know that Salah was legislated on the night of Mi'raj, which is many years down the road, the Prophet is still performing some type of prayer. So Salah 
is the main activity of the Muslim community in this phase. The second point that we see here is that Have you seen the one who forbids? So the Prophet is already being persecuted. So persecution doesn't happen when the message becomes public. No, in fact, some people, the likes of uh, Abu Jahl, the likes of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, they see the Prophet praying to one God in public as a disturbance, as something that needs to be challenged. So the Prophet is being harassed when he prays. And this is the first surah that's revealed. So you see that the ridicule, the mockery, the, uh, the persecution essentially begins alongside revelation. So this is not a phenomenon that takes place later on. So verses 9 to 19 of Surah Al-Alaq refer to someone who forbade the Prophet from praying. So again, the Prophet is not preaching in public. He's praying in public. He's praying in Masjid Al-Haram, but that in and of itself is enough to ruffle the feathers of some of the elites of Quraysh. Verse number 10 tells us that, you know, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَا عَبْدًا إِذَا صَلَّى This ayah also indicates that there was a form of prayer that was practiced by the Prophet which included prostration because the last ayah of Surah Al-Sajda is, is the, the, uh, of Surah Al-Alaq is one of the obligatory verses of Sajda. So we have, you know, 15 verses of Sajda in the Qur'an 11 of them are mustahab, 4 of them are obligatory. So you see that prostration is part of this worship, this prayer that the Prophet is performing. Now, the riwayat mention that who was, who was the one who was harassing the Prophet when he was praying? There are, Some names are mentioned, the most notable of them are Abu Jahl and Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Uh, definitely gave the Prophet a hard time uh, from the moment uh, he began his mission. So Surah Al-Alaq, the, the dominant view is that Surah Al-Alaq is the first surah that is revealed uh, in its entirety. Of course, first five verses were revealed and then perhaps the rest of the surah was revealed afterward. The second, and of course I'm not going to go through the entire Quran, I just want to share with you maybe you know 10 to 13 uh, surahs, uh, 10 to 13 of the first surahs that were revealed. So the second chapter that was revealed, and if, if you want a comprehensive list about the chronological order of revelation, you can refer, uh, for, for, the, for, for an English-speaking audience, you can refer to Martin Ling's uh, book, uh, The Prophet, His Life, based on the earliest sources. It was published in 19... 83 and you can you can take a look at that he has a few pages where he actually lists the the chronological order of revelation the second surah is surah al-qalam now again when you look at the content of the surah you see for example verses 2 and 6 are rebuttals of taunts that he is mad so we see here very you know you know when we think about islamophobia we have to remember, brothers and sisters, that Rasulullah was the first victim of Islamophobia. Surat al-Alaq indicates that he was prevented from praying. He's being harassed when he prays. Surat al-Qalam, the second surah that's revealed, Allah addresses the taunts. People are calling him Majnoon, an insane person. So again, the, the verbal abuse essentially begins with revelation itself. Verse number four, the famous ayah, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Verse number four, again, Allah reminds the Prophet. It's as though Allah is saying that, O Muhammad, you have a long road ahead of you. And you are already seeing hostility from Quraysh. The only way you're going to survive this, the only way that you're going to be able to endure this 
is that you have to draw strength from the fact that you are a man of integrity, that, that your excellent character, your akhlaq is what is going to make this message successful. It's not your, your military strength. Your magnanimous character is going to make you victorious in the end. And interestingly, when you look at verses 48 to 50 of Surah Al-Qalam, you see that Allah gives the Prophet a very important reminder. He reminds him of the story of Yunus. Now why is the story of Yunus relevant? Because Allah doesn't want the Prophet to lose patience with his people. That, you know, it's as though Allah is saying that, Oh Muhammad, if you, if you start thinking that there's no point in preaching to these Meccans and to Quraysh because they're so close-minded, don't make the same mistake as Yunus. Be patient with your people. Don't abandon them. Don't throw in the towel when things get difficult. When you feel that they're so close-minded and the opposition is so intense. Remain steadfast, O Muhammad. The third surah that's revealed, we have Surah Al-Muzammil. Again, when you look at the, the verses, when you look at the message of Surah Al-Muzammil, again, Allah addresses the taunts. And this is very important. You know, the fact that Allah is addressing the verbal abuse that the Prophet is experiencing highlights that Allah cares very much about the mental health of His Messenger. He cares very much about the emotional health of the Prophet. Because the emotional health of the Prophet is critical to the survival and the success of the message. Verse 11, again, Allah promises the Prophet that don't worry about them. Your job is not to, to deal with the, your, the, the repudiators. Allah says, I will take care of them. I will take care of the ones who insult you, who mock you, who ridicule you, who taunt you. And then, of course, uh, verse number 20 mentions a group of mu'mineen with the Prophet who are, have, who are unable to keep up the night vigil as long as Allah had advised them to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the recommendation is that dedicate at least a third of the night to worship. And of course, you know, very few of the uh, early companions are able uh, to do this. You know, probably, you know, Khadija, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the Prophet, you know, they're the, they're the elites who are able to stand uh, during those night vigils. But again, it's very telling that the prescription that Allah gives to the early Muslims who are being harassed, who are being abused, is that Salatul Layl. You have to build spiritual strength. The resilience will come from your spirituality. And I think that this is a very important message for us today. You know, it's not enough to just be an activist. We need to dedicate time to our spiritual development. Meaning that if you want to make change in the world, it's not about what you do in the streets only. That's not enough. You need to have a connection with the divine if, if you're going to be successful. Surah number four, again, in, in terms of chronological order, Surah Al-Muddathir, Ya ayyuha al-muddathir, qum fa'anthir wa rabbaka fakabbar. So these are the first three verses of Surah Al-Muddathir. So again, Allah is motivating the Prophet. You know, Ya Rasulullah, I know you're tired. I know you're exhausted. I know it's, it's, uh, it's very taxing to carry this weighty message. It's not easy to be made fun of, to be humiliated, to be mocked day in and day out. But you have to get up every day. You got to do it. Ya ayyuha al-muddathir qum You have to be consistent. You're going to have bad days, you're going to have good days, but you have to be consistent. You have to be disciplined. Now some have argued that this is the first surah that was revealed giving the Prophet the signal to make his message uh, public. But again, that's, uh, that's a minority opinion. Number five, Surah Al-Fatiha. So again, some 
scholars believe that Surah Al-Fatiha was the first Surah revealed to the Prophet. But again, that's a minority opinion. And so the fifth on the list is Surah Al-Fatiha. No, it doesn't have any historical significance per se, but, uh, and again, uh, Salah has not been officially legislated. So, uh, so again, the, the message of Surah Al-Fatiha is really a summary of the teachings of Islam. It becomes really a type of dua for the early Muslim community. Number six is Surah Lahab. So again, even though the Prophet is, is you know, he has a, made his message public, he's speaking in semi-private gatherings, he's, he's met with resistance from outsiders, and he, now he starts to feel what? He starts to feel resistance from his own family members, people who are the closest to him. Number seven is Surah At-Takwil. Uh, if you look at verses eight and nine, again, this is where you see some of the social justice dimensions of the Prophet's message. Verses eight and nine, they evoke sympathy for the victims of the Jahili custom of burying female infants alive. So female infanticide is one of the key social issues of the time. The Quran addresses it. The, the, the Muslim, you know, that becomes one of the slogans of the early Muslim community. And this, again, is a reminder for you and I that we have to be up to date. We have to know what are the issues of our time. And we have to be the advocates of these, these social justice issues. Number eight is Surah Al-A'la. Number nine is Surah Al-Layl. Number 10 is Surah Al-Fajr. Again, a lot of very, very powerful language about the Day of Judgment, about the impermanence of this earthly life, contrasted by the permanence of the hereafter. Allah speaks about the fate of believers, the dreadful fate of those who, know, who reject this message, who arrogantly turn away from the, uh, the message. And then you have Surah Al-Duha, which is the 11th, Surah that was revealed to the Prophet, and it seems that between these surahs and Surah Al Duha, there was a gap, there was a fatra, fatra tun al wahi, there was a gap, a cessation in revelation. So, there are different reports about how long revelation was suspended. Some put the figure at a few days, some mention a few months. Allahu alam, but we have a narration from. Ibn Abbas that says for 15 days revelation was withheld from him. And this is significant because if if 46 surahs of the Quran are revealed within five months, you know, a half a month without any revelation is, is definitely alarming. So Ibn Abbas says for 15 days revelation was withheld from him, from the Prophet. So the pagans, uh, they started to taunt and mock the Prophet. They started to ridicule him, saying, Muhammad's God has grown angry with him and bid him farewell. He has forsaken Muhammad. If his charge had been from God, it would have come continuously. So the mushrikeen use this as an opportunity to delegitimize the Prophet. They say, look, if he's a Prophet, how come revelation has stopped? You know, this is a sign that he's not really a messenger of God. Now, scholars have debated over why this happened. Now, of course, this could be a divine test. You know, in the same way that, you know, in the same way that Musa was delayed in uh, on Mount Sinai, and that delay, that ten-day delay, uh, in returning to his people, was a test for the Israelites. This also could have been a test for the early Muslims to see if they really believe that Muhammad is uh, a true messenger of God. But I think more importantly is that Surah Al-Duha, you know, the, the fatra, the, the suspension of revelation, more importantly, highlights that the Qur'an is not the word of Muhammad. Because if the Qur'an was the concoction of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, revelation would have never stopped. Why put himself in a position where he's being mocked and ridiculed by his enemies? 
So the fact that revelation is suspended and he's being taunted and he doesn't have a reply to for them indicates that the Quran is the word of God, that the, the words of this book are coming to him from a higher power, from a higher authority. There is a higher authority that is managing the revelation of the Quran and it's not the Prophet. And then after the revelation of Surah Al-Duha, we have Surah Al-Inshirah or Surah, surah Al-Sharh, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak, which is a surah that consoles the heart of the Prophet. And then you have Surah Al-Asr, and then of course the, the list continues. So 46 surahs, I repeat, 46 chapters of the Qur'an are revealed to the Prophet in the first five months of his Risala. Now, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about five months, a little over five months into the Prophet's mission, his, his, uh, the, the revelation of the Qur'an, Allah reveals the verse of warning, Ayatul Indar. So at the end of the, the last verse of Surah Ash-Shu'ara, Allah says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقَرَبِينَ and warn your nearest of kin or your closest kin. So this is 47th in sequence. Surah Ash-Shu'ara is the 47th surah that is revealed. So this is about a, a, a little over five months after the Prophet receives first receives revelation. And now he is commanded to take his message to a new level. And that is... You were, Ya Rasulullah, you were preaching in semi-private gatherings. Now it's time to make the message public. The time has come to make your da'wah public. But first, extend an invitation to your extended family. Invite your extended family, your nearest kin. When the Prophet receives this ayah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he summons Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is 13 years old when this ayah is revealed. And the Prophet asks Ali to prepare a feast, a feast of mutton and milk, which is basically lamb and milk and perhaps well, you know, whatever else they had, maybe barley bread or rice. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, by the command of the Prophet, he prepares a feast. And you can imagine how much food needs to be prepared to feed 40 men. Now the amount of food that was prepared typically would only satiate one person. But this shows you the barakah of food that is prepared by Ali ibn Abi Talib. Food that's being ma a feast that is being managed by Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imagine the barakah of this meal. So, and, and this is amazing that the Prophet gives this job, an important job, the first feast where the Prophet is going to make the message public. He gives this responsibility to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So, Ali makes the necessary preparations. He invites. Uh, the men from the clans of Hashim and, and Muttalib for this feast. Everyone eats, they break bread. But before the Prophet has an opportunity to give his speech, Abu Lahab, he, he interrupts, he makes a joke, and then the, the gathering is spoiled. It wasn't a good time for the Prophet to, uh, to, make, to uh, make the invitation. So the very next day, Rasulullah renews the invitation. And again, Ali prepares the same meal, the same quantity, a quantity that would normally only satiate one person. But arrangements are made. And then, and you just imagine the scene. The Prophet is in his home. Forty members of his clan are in attendance. Everyone is there. Abbas, Hamza. Ja'far, Abu Talib, Abu Lahab, his cousins. Now, after they finish their meal, the Prophet ﷺ, he stands. 
and he addresses the groom. He addresses the room. He addresses his clan. He says, Ya Bani Abdul Muttalib, O sons of Abdul Muttalib, Inni Kajitukum Bihayri Dunya Wal Akhira. O sons of Abdul Muttalib, I have come to you with the best of this world and the hereafter. وَقَدْ أَمَرَنِ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ أَنْ أَدْعُوَكُمْ إِلَيْهِ God has commanded me to invite you to Him. I'm calling you to Tawheed, to monotheism. فَأَيُّكُمْ يُوَازِرُنِي عَلَىٰ أَمْرِي فَأَيُّكُمْ يُوَازِرُنِي عَلَىٰ أَمْرِي هَذَا وَيَكُونُ أَخِي وَوَصِيِّي وَخَلِيفَتِي فِيكُمْ so who among you will support me in this matter and become my brother, my vicegerent, and my successor among you? This incident becomes one of the most famous early events in the, the prophetic message. This is known as Hadith al It's a very widely transmitted Hadith, and of course, there are different versions of the hadith, and by different versions, I mean the, the difference in the wording. But the gist of it is what I presented. Now, when the Prophet invites his clan to support him, everyone remains silent. The only one who responds, at least publicly, now, there's it's very positive, of course, we'll speak about Abu Talib and, and Hamz and others. It's very possible that many of them did believe the Prophet, but they were hesitant to make their support public for various reasons and calculations. Now, what's what we see, and this is unanimously reported, the only one who stands and gives unwavering support so the Prophet is the 13-year-old Ali, alayhi salatu wassalam. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib himself, he narrates the incident. فَقُلْتُ So after the Prophet gives his speech, فَقُلْتُ وَأَنَا أَحْدَثُهُمْ سِنًّا Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, So I, I said, and I was the youngest of them, Ya Nabi Allah. O oh, Prophet of God. Look at Amir al mumin He doesn't address him as Muhammad or my, my cousin. He, he is the first one among them to address him as the Messenger of God, the Prophet of God. Ya Nabi Allah, akunu waziruk alayhi. I will be the one to assist you, to support you. Now the Prophet, what does he do? Does the Prophet say, you know, unfortunately, when we speak about the early converts to Islam, the early supporters of the Prophet, Typically, in the Sunni tradition, Abu Bakr is mentioned. And, and we'll speak about whether or not Abu Bakr was the first Muslim or not. When you mention Ali ibn Abi Talib as being the foremost in supporting the Prophet, typically and unfortunately, his support is trivialized. Meaning that they say that oh, he, was the, he was the first child to believe, to support the Prophet. Now, what does the Prophet say? Does the Prophet take Ali seriously, or does he just say, you know, you're young, I appreciate it, but I'm 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 waiting for an adult to offer support? No, on the contrary. Ali ibn Abi Talib himself says, The Prophet placed his blessed hand on the neck of Ali. وَخَلِيفَتِي فِيكُمْ In verily, this is my brother, my successor and my khalifa among you. فَاسْمَعُوا لَهُ وَأَطِيعُوا The Prophet doesn't just say thank you, O Ali, I appreciate it. He says he's my brother, my wasi, my khalifa after, among you. فَاسْمَعُوا لَهُ وَأَطِيعُوا Listen to him and obey him. Obey him. 
Meaning that obedience to Ali, even at this age, especially those who are hearing this message, it's, obedient, it's obligatory upon them. فَقَامَ الْقَوْمُ يَضْحَكُونَ The elders, not all of them, but many of them, stood up laughing. وَيَقُولُونَ لِأَبِي طَالِبِ And they turned, they started laughing when the Prophet said, Ali is my brother, my successor, my khalifa. Listen to him and obey him. They started to laugh. And not only did they laugh, they started to ridicule Abu Talib. وَيَقُولُونَ لِأَبِي طَالِبْ قَدْ أَمَرَكَ أَن تَسْمَعَ لِعَلِيٍ وَتُطِيعٍ They said to Abu Talib, Look, Muhammad is commanding you to listen to Ali and to obey him. The, the father now has to obey the son. Now, so again, this was a very disappointing moment for the Prophet. You know, many of his own family members are laughing and they're not taking this issue seriously. Now, when we speak about those first, those early days of Islam, an important question is who were the earliest converts? Who were the earliest supporters of the Prophet? Now, in our previous episodes, we mentioned that the first batch of people to officially join Islam, of course, when we say officially, Ali was always a Muslim in, in the general sense. He was always a monotheist, always submitted to God. But we're speaking about his acceptance of the Sharia of Muhammad, the new Sharia of Muhammad. So, of course, Ali is among, he's the first male Convert, he's awwalul qawmi islama, he's the first of them in Islam. Khadija, of course. And we mentioned in our previous episodes that Ali ibn Abi Talib himself says that Islam in its entirety only comp consisted of three people Rasulullah, myself, and Khadija. So there was a time when Islam, the Muslim community, only consisted of three people, Rasulullah, Khadija, and Ali. And then you have Zayd ibn, Zayd ibn Haritha, the adopted son of the Prophet, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, as we mentioned, when the Prophet was praying uh, between the age of 40 to 43, Abu Talib encourages his son to join them. And this is, you know, I think evidence, very clear evidence that Abu Talib believed in the Prophet. You know, if anyone had any doubt... If he, did, if he believed that the Prophet was a false prophet, why would he encourage his son to join him in Salah? This is just one of the many proofs uh, for the Islam of um, Abu Talib. Of course, Abu Talib himself, we can include him on the list of the earliest converts. In fact, I would argue that Abu Talib believed in the prophethood of Rasulullah on the day that he was born. You know, as we mentioned in our early episodes about the birth of the Prophet, Abu Talib, when, when his wife Fatima bint Asad shared with him some of the shocking things that she witnessed when Amin was delivering the Prophet as, a, as, a, as a, an infant, he said to her that, why are you surprised? In 30 years you are going to give birth to the successor of this child. So it's very, and this is mentioned in Al-Kafi, it's very clear from our sources that Abu Talib was the foremost of the believers. And he, he simply did not publicize his Islam to protect the early Muslim community because if he is perceived as a mushrik by the mushrikeen, it puts him in a very important negotiating position. And this is precisely what allows him to protect uh, the Prophet, because the Quraysh see him as one of their own. I'll mention some of the early female uh, converts, because I think when we speak about the early Muslims, we tend to overlook the devotion of the, the early female uh, converts. Um, um al Fadl, the wife of Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, she's among the earliest 
uh, converts. Abbas does not join Islam until after the Hijrah. You know, he was one of the uh, prisoners in the Battle of Badr. His wife believes in the Prophet uh, much earlier than that. Safiya, the Prophet's aunt, is among the early converts, as well as her son. She influenced her, her son. So Zubair, as Zubair ibn al-Awam, is one of the early converts. So you see Zubair is a cousin of the Prophet from his, uh, his mother, who is the, the Prophet's aunt. So Umm al-Fadh, Safiya, Zubair is one of the early converts. Asma bint Umais, who at this juncture in Islamic history is the wife of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Umm Ayman is another important name that we see in the early history of Islam. Umm Ayman, if you recall, she was a servant of Abdullah, the Prophet's father. Uh, she was she basically was a second mother to the Prophet, especially after the Prophet lost his own mother Amina. She cared for him, she looked after him. And the Prophet freed her on the day of his wedding to Khadija. Uh, she later marries a man from Yathrib. They have a son by the name of Ayman, hence the name Um Ayman. She then returns uh, to the Prophet's household for reasons that are unclear. And the Prophet encourages her to marry Zayd ibn Haritha, his, uh, his adopted son. And they have uh, a son by the name of Usama. And this is the Usama who is a teenager when the Prophet is on his deathbed. And the Prophet commanded all of his companions to join the army of Usama. So this is the Usama. He's the son of Zayd ibn, ibn Haritha and uh, Um Ayman. Other notable early converts include Mus'ab ibn Umair, and we'll speak more about him as we continue our series. Bilal ibn, uh, ibn Rabah is one of the early converts. Uh, he was tortured for uh, converting to Islam. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who was his uh, slave owner, would whip him. He would make him lay down on the hot sand. He would place a heavy boulder on his chest just to make, get him to denounce Muhammad and his message. And whenever he, whatever he tried, he would whip him, he would lash him. And Bilal would say, Ahadun Ahad. He would never relinquish his belief in Tawheed. Of course, you have Ammar ibn Yasir. And Ammar ibn Yasir is unique because here you have an entire family joining Islam. You know, typically what was happening in Mecca is that you have, you know, a son joining Islam, but the father is a mushrik and the mother is a mushrika, or you have one parent become Muslim and the siblings and the children are uh, mushrikeen. But with Ammar ibn Yasir, you have his father Yasir and Sumayya. And inshallah, we'll speak about how they become the first martyrs in Islam. Abu Dhar, who comes from the tribe of uh, Ghaffar, he comes from a tribe that's famous for looting. They were highway bandits. Abu Dhar he you know he hears that there is a a prophet who has emerged in mecca he goes to mecca as a visitor uh, he stays with uh, he, he basically sleeps in the masjid until ali ibn abi talib sees him and he says what are you here for he says i'm here to meet this new prophet who has appeared ali secretly arranges a meeting between rasulullah and abu dhar and the rest was history the moment abu dhar meets the prophet he believes in him and he wants to join this new movement. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, again, is one of the uh, early converts. Now, now we come to the, the, the million dollar question, as we say. Now you may ask me, why is Abu Bakr not on your list? When did Abu Bakr join Islam? Now, the popularized narrative is that he was the first adult male and they say adult male, adult to, you know, to basically highlight that the Islam of Ali was inferior to the Islam of Abu Bakr. So this is the popularized narrative, and that is that Abu Bakr was the first adult male to convert. The problem with this opinion is that there is a lot of, there are reports that contradict this. 
there are a number of discrepancies about when Abu Bakr actually converted, actually uh, joined Islam. If you look at Tariq al-Tabri, and I'll, I'll just share a few, just so you see that it's not a it's not it's not something that's unanimously agreed upon. If you look at Tariq al-Tabri, volume two, page sixty, the narration is from. Muhammad ibn Sa'd ibn Abi, Abi Waqqas. So Muhammad, the son of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, who is one of the early converts. He's one of the senior companions of the Prophet. So Muhammad ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, he asks his father, who was an early convert, who was a very famous companion of the Prophet, قُلْتُ Abi, أَكَانَ Abu Bakrin أَوَّلُكُمْ Islama. Was Abu Bakr the first among you to convert to Islam? So, Matt, so this is the son who's asking his father, an elderly man, you know, who, who was there during those early days of Islam. Is it true that Abu Bakr was the first Muslim? Look at the answer. قال لا. He said no. ولقد أسلم قبله أكثر من خمسين. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he says, no, in fact, there were 50, there were more than 50 who converted before him. Now, I want you to think about this. If there are more than 50 who converted to Islam before Abu Bakr, where does that place him on the timeline? Now, it's agreed upon that he, he, he was one of the muhajireen meaning that he converted during the Meccan period. But when? If you say that more than 50 converted before him, that means that it's highly plausible, highly probable that he joined Islam in the late Meccan, the middle or the late Meccan period. Because the Prophet did not have more than 200 people migrate with him to, to Medina. How, how many Muslims went on Hijrah with the Prophet? It's not a very large number. So if you say more than 50 joined Islam before Abu Bakr, this shows that he either became Muslim in the middle or the end of the Meccan period. Now, Tabarani, who's a famous Sunni scholar who wrote uh, Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir in, uh, in the third century after the Hijrah, he, the third or fourth century after the Hijrah, he says, and this is basic, this is a report from Tabarani, مِنْهَا مَا رَوَاهُ الطَّبَرَانِ مِنْ أَنَّ أَبَا بَكْرٍ آمَنَ بَعْدَ ظُهُورْ مُعْجِزَةِ إِسْرَاءِ وَمِعْرَاجِ النَّبِيِ Tabarani says that Abu Bakr became a believer, he accepted Islam after the Mi'raj, after the miracle of Isra and Mi'raj which took place So there's a typo here. So this is about a year and a half before Hijrah. Now, Mi'raj may have happened more than once in Mecca. But at the very least, if you take the earliest reports, that means at least three to four years after Ba'tha. If you take, if you're speaking about, if you believe that there were multiple ascensions, Tabarani here mentions that this is a reference to the Mi'raj that took place a year and a half before the Hijrah. And it was then that he, he became called a Siddiq, according to them. Of course, we, we, don't, we believe that these are fabricated reports. That's when he became known as Siddiq. Because... It was such an unbelievable story, and the fact that he believed um, means, according again, this is according to the Sunni narrative, that he, he became known as a siddiq If you look at a Dhahabi, a Dhahabi who is staunchly anti-Shia, in his book, Seer A'lam al-Nubala, the, the biographies of, of the, the notables, the notable uh, Islamic personalities. 
ما رواه الذهبي عن الحسن بن زيد حسن بن زيد ناريتس أن عليا أول ذكر أسلم According to ذهبي according to this narration from Al-Hasan ibn Zayd, Ali was the first male to become Muslim. And then who was next? ثُمَّ أَسْلَمَ زيد, And then Zayd ibn Haritha. ثُمَّ جَعْفَرَ ibn Abi Talib. Then Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. وَكَانَ أَبُوْ بَكْرِ الرَّابِعَ أَوَ الْخَامِسِ And Abu Bakr was the fourth or the fifth. The point that I'm trying to make is that there are many discrepancies even within Sunni Hadith literature about when Abu Bakr actually converted and it seems that it, it happened it, it, he was definitely not among the early uh, Muslims it, potentially he converted during the middle or the end of the Meccan period and and for sure he wasn't the first because if he was the first don't you think he would have used this as an argument in Saqifa if you look at the narrations about Saqifa, even in Sunni hadith reports, he never mentions that he was the first one to believe in the Prophet. Now you would think if it was true, don't you think that that would have been a good argument as to why you should be the Khalifa of the Prophet? He doesn't mention it. In fact, it was never even mentioned during his life that he was the first. These are things that were edited later on to make sense of you know, how Islamic history played out. It's a very revisionist uh, lens through which uh, we're looking. And with that, inshallah, we'll conclude our discussion and we'll continue speaking about uh, the early uh, the early Muslims and the, the movement of Islam during those uh, early years. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for lending me your ears. And I look forward to having you join me uh, next week on uh, another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Any questions or comments? In the hadith from uh, Tahrif al-Tabari, uh, yeah. it, it was interesting that even at that time, the son was thinking that Abu Bakr might be the first Khalifa. Yeah, because again, this is—I mean, th this shows you how how people's memory is molded. Because again, th this is presumably after he, uh, after the early, after the Khulafa, after. He comes to power. Again, I don't know when this conversation takes place, but presumably after uh, Abu Bakr becomes Khalifa. So, and, and this goes to show you how this narrative is being pushed in the, in the early history of Islam to justify and give legitimacy to the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. So you see again, I mean, Muawiyah did this. Uh, with the uh, with the Umayyads, this is a product of uh, of that. Um, according to again, to, according to the the Shi'a uh, perspective, this is this is propaganda to give legitimacy to uh, to the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, and, and it shows you that you know these types of claims were circulating very early uh, in the history of Islam. But you see, uh, Saad ibn Abi Waqqas uh, very boldly makes that uh, that correction. And the surahs that were revealed, the first 46 or so surahs, were they all complete surahs that were revealed or were they some of them partially revealed? I don't know. I would have to go back and, and do more research, but many of them were short surahs. So the shorter ones, most likely they were revealed in their entirety. But it may be that uh, that uh, that some of them were partial. I, I would have to, uh, to look... Uh, and, and do a bit more research on that. But the bulk of the surahs were revealed, the 46 surahs was revealed uh, during that during the first uh, five months. As I mentioned, uh, Martin Lings uh, does uh, he, he presents a pretty thorough uh, list of uh, of the surahs that were revealed, and he mentions you know if there are certain verses that were not revealed and uh, whose revelation came later on. 
And uh, there's a request that there are various good deeds that are attributed to Abu Bakr in the early days. So uh, can we also have some discussion about those as well? Yes, we're, we're going to speak about uh, about that, uh, especially when we when we speak about when we address, you know, the how Bilal, for example, is 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 freed. Was it was it the wealth? Because in the Sunni tradition, Abu Bakr is portrayed as the first one to believe in the Prophet, the closest friend of the Prophet, a wealthy merchant whose wealth the Prophet relies on to free slaves. So we'll we'll speak about that, and uh, and you'll see again. This is if you look at the facts, it's highly unlikely that Abu Bakr was was a wealthy merchant, especially if you look at his family background, and uh, and we'll get into uh, into that detail, and, and and we'll get into a lot of detail about. Abu Bakr, especially when we speak about the Hijrah, because one of the his accolades that are celebrated in Sunni Islam is the fact that he was the companion of the Prophet in the cave of uh, in the cave when the Prophet was was leaving Mecca and heading towards Medina. We'll look at the the literature. We'll look at the Quranic verses and and try to come to an objective conclusion about whether or not these things uh, are actually merits or there are things that are, are are not really merits if you look at the uh, the facts. Hi, Shaykh. Thank you very much. Ahsantum. Barakallah fikum. Thank you so much again to all of you, especially Zayn, for, uh, for facilitating these discussions. And uh, I look forward to going on this, this journey with you. And I hope you're all finding this beneficial. Uh, so, so we finished episode 14 and uh, so you you can see now just the the level of depth that we're going into that we're we're, we're likely going to approach the 100 mark before you know we reach the end of our series inshallah